we were discussing Maxwell's equations. And uh, so far we've got three of Maxwell's equations. Let's start off by writing down the Maxwell's equations that describe the electric field. So can someone tell me what one of those equations is? Great. Divergence of E is equal to rho over epsilon naught. What is that equation called? Gauss law. Gauss law. Good. That's the differential form of the Gauss law. Absolutely. Um, can somebody tell me what does this tell us about the geometry of the electric field lines? Good. So these field lines are open. They start from positive charges and they end on negative charges. Good. What's the second Maxwell equation that we've got for the electric field? Curl of E equals? Minus dB dt. Very good. What law is this called? Faraday's, Faraday's law. Good. So, this is Faraday's law. That's the Gauss law. Those two are two of Maxwell's equations. What is the geometry of these field lines? Good. So when we have a changing magnetic field, we'll produce electric field lines, but all of the electric field lines that we produced are closed loops. So this equation is telling you about closed loops of electric field. This one is telling you about open lines of electric field. Good. Uh, who can tell me the equations for the magnetic field? Good. Curl of B is equal to mu naught times the current density. And this is called Ampere's law. Divergence of B is equal to zero. Good. This one is the only one of Maxwell's equations that doesn't get a name. What is this equation telling us? No magnetic monopoles. So any time we see a magnetic field line, we know that it will be closed. They never start somewhere and end somewhere. Okay? That's not how magnetic field lines are. Now, um, we've played around with all of these equations, except maybe for Faraday's law. So I want to say just a few things about Faraday's law now before we continue. So first of all, let's imagine that um, so, so Z hat will be coming out of the board. Okay, So Z hat comes out of the board. Let's imagine that I have a magnetic field B which is equal to T times by Z hat where T is time. So as time passes what happens? The magnetic field points out of the board and its magnitude is increasing. So if you have to draw it as a vector, it points out of the board and its magnitude keeps getting longer as time passes. Everyone happy with that? Good. What does Faraday's law tell me? I've got this magnetic field, what can you tell me about the curl of E? The curl of E will be equal to minus sine, d by dt will be? 1, and we'll get a z hat. So the curl of E points opposite to the direction that B increases. So B is coming out of the board, and it's increasing. Which way does the electric field curl?
circle minus e hat so you take your right hand put your thumb in the direction of minus e hat and the electric field looks like that right so that's how the electric field would look e would look like that with this b now let's take b to be 1 over t z hat can someone tell me now what is the curl of e So you say, what do you say, minus? Plus? Minus or plus? Plus. One over t squared. Z hat. So which that, what does this electric field look like? The magnetic field is still coming out of the board, but the electric field now goes in the z hat direction. So take your right hand, there's your thumb. The electric field goes that way. So that's what the electric field looks like. So this electric field is opposite to that electric field. This electric field points out this way and it's increasing in magnitude. This magnetic field points out this way but it's decreasing in magnitude. The thing that's important is how the magnetic field changes, not where it points. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Good. Now, I'm going to draw some electric field lines now. I want you guys to tell me what the magnetic field is doing. So, Can you tell me about the magnetic field over here? Are there any field lines curling about that point? Over here? Why do you say it's coming out of the board over there, Emil? Okay, so now let's take a look. Let's pick a path C. That's our path C, okay? And I want to calculate that C. I want to calculate the integral of E dot dx along that closed path C. At the bottom of the path, what will... Okay, E dot dr. At the bottom of the path, what, does, what is E dot dr? Is it positive or negative? So let's take a look. Where's dx? It's tangent to the path always, right? So at the bottom of the path, which way does dx point? That way. Which way does the electric field point? That way. What's E dot dx? Negative. What does it look like at the top of the path? Positive. So we're adding up a bunch of negatives with a bunch of positives. What are we going to get in total when we sum it up? Zero. Zero. So this is naught. But by Stokes' theorem, this is equal to the curl of E dot dA over area A. Can you tell me where area A is? Very good. 
It's that region. Absolutely. Where does DA point? Out of the border, into the board. Into the board. Very good. So if this is zero, we get told the curl of E is zero. Everyone happy with that? If the curl of E is zero, what does Faraday's law tell us? B is not changing. So there may be some constant value for B here, okay? But we do know that B is not changing. What's happening here? So you need to do exactly what I did. You need to put a path. Let's call this path C. What is E dot DX along this path? Positive. Always positive. Does everyone agree? So if E dot DX or E dot DR integrated along that path is always positive, it tells you the integral of the curl of E is always positive. If the curl of E dot DA is positive, which way is DA for this path? Into the board. The curl of E integrated DA is positive. So which way does the curl of E point? Into the board. If the curl of E points into the board, how is B changing? It's getting, it's pointing out, well, it, it's pointing more out, okay? It might be pointing in and getting shorter, or pointing out and getting longer. But that tells you how B is changing. For this uh, situation, let's again pick C like that. What is the integral of C dot dx, uh, integral of e dot, D, e dot dr along C? Negative. Which way is dA? Into the board, which way is the curl of E? Out of the board, because we want the curl of E dot dA to be negative. So the curl of E must point in the opposite direction to dA. So what can you tell me about dB dt? Curl of E points out of the board, so what can you tell me about dB dt? It's getting more and more pointing into the board. That's the rate of change of B. Okay, everyone happy with that? What's happening at this point? What's happening there? B is not changing, but, but can you tell me what's at that point? The field is? This is the starting point for all of those field lines. So what's sitting at that point? What charge? Positive charge. What's sitting at this point? Negative charge. So if somebody just gives you a picture of the electric field, can you see that by looking at the field lines, you should be able to say where are the charges located, how B is changing. Everyone happy with that? And that's those two of Maxwell's equations, the two electricity ones. So, in fact, these encode all of the geometry of the field lines. Just by looking at the geometry of the field lines, we can tell where the charges are and um, how the magnetic field is changing. Good. Now, let's try to... Um, figure out what's wrong with Ampere's law, okay? And uh, let, let's see, why if we take these equations together, why do we get some problem, some contradiction? Now the easiest way to see that there's a contradiction, okay, is that here we are dealing with electricity and magnetism. So another equation that I need to write down is the equation for the conservation of charge. Can someone tell me what the what is charge conservation? D rho D T plus divergence of J. 
Good, it's equal to zero. Absolutely. So this is the conservation of charge. If we thought that we had a complete theory for electricity and magnetism, these four equations should describe all of electricity and magnetism. Okay? And they should work together. We should be able to apply them together. Now, can we imagine a situation where d rho dt is not zero? Do you think that can happen, d rho dt being non-zero? Charge can collect somewhere, right? In fact, uh, we, when we did our electroscope, if we first take the cup and we put it next to the needle, the needle is not attracted. After we charge the cup on our hair and we put it next to the needle, the needle is attracted. So we've changed the charge density on the cup. Everyone agree? So is d rho dt always zero? No. Now, let's take Ampere's law. Okay? And uh, from Ampere's law, <clears throat> I know this is true. So if this vector field is equal to that vector field, then the divergence of this vector field has to be equal to the divergence of this vector field. So I'm going to take the divergence of both sides. What is the divergence of a curve? So we have learned that the divergence of J is always zero. But that means that d rho dt is always zero. And that's wrong. That's not correct. So we already see that if we want these five equations to hold at the same time, we've already derived something that is incorrect. So they must be wrong with one of the equations, at least, written on the blackboard. And now, your job, if, if you were Maxwell, would be to figure out in which equation is there an error. And remember, any experiment that you choose to study, any experiment at all, you get the right answer from those four equations. You don't have experiment to guide you. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you the kind of consideration that Maxwell went through. So I want to consider the following situation. I'm going to have a piece of wire and a conducting plate. And then over here, I'm going to have another conducting plate and a piece of wire. And what we will imagine is a current flows. So there is a current I that is flowing along this piece of wire. And the current I flows over here as well. Now, when you study this, no current can flow across here. So because the current I flows, this plate starts to become positive. It charges up, it becomes positive. And current is flowing away from that plate, so this plate starts to become negative. We can imagine a situation like this. This is just charging a capacitor up. Okay? And we know we can charge a capacitor up. What we want to do now is study this situation very carefully, because by studying this system, we're going to figure out how to fix Ampere's law. So let's first of all see that there's a problem. Good. So, I want to illustrate something about the system, but I want us all to visualize it correctly. So let's do the following.
There is our capacitor. And I'm going to have another copy of our capacitor. I want to consider a path C that circles around the capacitor. So the path C goes around, oh, let me make it the same path. So it goes round the back, round the back, and um, it comes around the front. So this is going to be C and C. Now, okay, I need two volunteers. Pum line. Thanks for volunteering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for volunteering. I'm so quick too. You guys are eager. Okay. Pumlani, this is a piece of wire. Come grab the wire. Okay. Face the audience. Good. Let's move the wire around like that. Now, I want you to hold the plate of the capacitor over there. So you need to hold the wire, but I also want you to hold the plate of the capacitor. So grab the exam pad. Good. Hold that there. <coughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah. Here is your capacitor and your wire. Okay. So you put the wire there and hold the capacitor plate. Good. Okay. Now, this plate is going to charge and become negative. This plate is going to charge and become positive. When will I be able to describe the field very accurately? When the two plates are very, very close to each other. If the two plates are very close to each other, what formula can I use for the electric field in the middle? The infinite charge sheet. Good. So we're going to put the two plates, okay guys, close, close, close to each other. Good. Now, our path C goes around the capacitor and back here again. So that's C. I'm going to use Stokes' theorem. I'm going to turn the integral over C into an integral over a surface S. How is S related to C? C is the boundary of S. Good. Now, can you see, when this path is here, one way of drawing the surface is that it cuts the wire and goes down. So I can draw, here's the path, and I can have the surface coming through, cutting the wire. Is everyone happy with that? Good. So, that's going to be our first surface S. It will cut the wire. And I will make a little mark where it cuts the wire. So, the surface ends somewhere here. And then it folds over and it actually touches the wire and it ends somewhere there. Everyone happy with that? But there's another way to draw the surface S. I can draw the surface S so that it passes in the middle of the two plates. Everyone happy with that? So the surface S can go in between the two plates. Okay, thanks guys. You were great capacitors. <laughs> So the second surface that we can have actually goes through the middle of the plate and does not cut the wire. So the wire doesn't go through S. In this case, the wire does go through S. Now, I'm going to take Ampere's law. And for this case, I am going to say, let me take the curl of B, which is equal to mu naught, J, and um, I am going to integrate both sides 
dot dA through the surface S. Integral J dot dA through the surface S. What is this side equal to? Mu naught times by I, the current flowing through the surface S. And why is there current flowing through the surface S? Because the wire goes through S. And there's current flowing down the wire. Everyone happy with that? I can also write the integral of the curl of B dot dA over S as the integral of B dot dx over the path C. Everyone happy with that? Good. So this is for the first way that we drew S. Now let's look at the second way. Again, the curl of B must be equal to mu naught J. Now we integrate this dot dA over S. And if we now integrate j dot dA over S, can you tell me what this integrates to? Zero. Because that surface goes in between the two plates of the capacitor. So no charge is flowing past that surface. There's no charge moving past it. So the net current through that surface is zero. So this is naught. But by Stokes' theorem, this is the integral of b dot dx over the same path c. So from the second situation, we say integral of b dot dx over c is 0. But from the first situation, the integral of b dot dx is mu naught i. Can everybody see that there's something wrong with Ampere's law?